Several years ago, a mid-level manager at Chick-fil-A um, started rattling some cages inside Chick-fil-A. And um, when I went down there in Atlanta to speak at a Weston A. Price Foundation, she found out, and, she, and of course Atlanta is where Chick-fil-A is headquartered. And um, so she pushed the executive vice presidents to uh, meet with me. And they were not interested, but they appreciated her, and she was up and comer and sharp. And so, um, so we met. We had dinner at a nice restaurant uh, there in Atlanta, since I was there anyway. And uh, these three or four executive vice presidents of Chick Fil A came, and uh, and the, the, you could tell there was some tension. They weren't too keen on, you know, what was going to happen here. And um, we, I. I can be diplomatic when I need to be, and started <laughs> off with gentle stuff. <clears throat> but things changed when we, and they were all good guys, they were all good, you know, Southern Baptists and good, good fellows. And I finally asked them, does God care? Does God care what kind of chicken you serve? Does God care how those chickens are raised? The whole conversation flipped on its end at that point. That was something they had never thought about. And from then on, they smiled and we dug down into, um, into the situation. And then, you know, uh, a month later, they came up in the corporate jet, landed here in Weir's Cave, came out, spent the day with us, had dinner with us, Teresa fixed the uh, chicken uh, <laughs> uh, for them, had a great time. And, uh, and, and they asked me, so, so how can Chick-fil-A get good chicken? But the, the turning point of the question, and, and, and they worked on it for a year and then it was too hard. But, but anyway, <laughs> the point I'm making is the question, the question that turned the conversation around was, does God care? See, I think, I think in the faith community, we're scared to ask that question. We don't like the consequences. And the next one, the next basic contextual thing I want to bring out, and then we're going to delve into this, is that creation is an object lesson of spiritual truth. What's the point of it all? The point of it all is so you can speak in parables. So you can tell stories. So you can give people, because see, we humans, we have a real problem in the spiritual realm. We can't see it. We don't live in it. Plenty of people poo-poo it. And so we need visceral objects to hang principle on. So I've got a list here of kind of object lessons uh, that I think we can glean from, from creation. For example, you know, we, we hear about the gifts of the Spirit. We, we read about those in several places in the New Testament, the gifts of the Spirit. And, and, and I would suggest that we can appreciate how the gifts of the Spirit can run in the church by appreciating how the gifts of different life forms exist in nature. Everything has a, a relational complexity and is fundamentally integrated and not segregated. It's fundamentally integrated and not segregated. So that order, the functionality of things, comes from an order. You know, so when the world experts um, told us that uh, there's a new way to feed cows, where we grind up dead cows and feed them, to, feed them to cows, our family didn't embrace that, not because we didn't want science, not because we didn't like new ideas, not because we didn't like the U.S. dollar. Messed up. <laughs> we didn't embrace it because we looked around the world and said, where is an herbivore eating carrion? It didn't exist. Herbivores fill a function. Buzzards fill a function. Chickens fill a function. And there is order. And this is how order is supposed to be expressed in the church. We're not all preachers, we're not all musicians, we're not all, uh, some people have the gift of hospitality, you know, you get the gifts, all right, you, you get the gifts of hospitality, you, you get all these things, and, and 
the whole idea is to create a habitat that affirms each gift and stimulates each gift to be expressed in its most beautiful, um, you know, phenotypical physiological expression, its greatest distinctiveness. And so order is important. And 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 uh, and this is important for you know for abundance and all those kinds of things. So, so again, the, the diversity and the niches that we see out here help to give us an object lesson of how we're supposed to function as a church. And you know, the extrovert is not supposed to be um, hated by the introvert. They talk too much, or the introvert is supposed to be hated by the extrovert. They never say anything. You know, I can't get the idea. Or the messy is not supposed to be hated by the cleany. And the starter is not supposed to be hated by the finisher. And the salesman, gift to gab storyteller is not to be hated by the engineer designer. Are you with me? It's, it's an object lesson. The, 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 the functionality of the way it's supposed to work is an object lesson of this tremendous spiritual truth that we all have things to contribute to the body. Next one. <clears throat> Whosoever will, that's a spiritual truth. Whosoever will may come. How about whosoever will, a, a, an object lesson of whosoever will is, is accessible food. That we should have a food system that stimulates personal access. We can all feed ourselves. We can all grow food. I mean, this idea that, uh, you know, a, a homeowner's association would prohibit a garden. And had a lady call me from Texas, you know. She said, I just got fined by the homeowner's association for a tomato plant. <laughs> we can have, a, we can have uh, inedible landscaping, but a tomato plant is farming. And that violates the, home, uh, the, the, homestead, the homeowner's association standards. How about lab-grown meat you know if our food has to come through a bill gates billion dollar laboratory how whosoever will is that but as long as the sun shines and the rain grows and grass grows you can have a milk cow in your backyard you can grow a sheep you can you can have whosoever will access to food <coughs> excuse me that's that's incredible these prohibitions on growing um, difficulty of being able to get food from regulations uh, you know you no, you can't you can't get a t-bone from that farmer because it didn't go through a, a federally inspected facility we should be we should be as a culture as, as Christians as a faith community we should be uh, uh, pushing for for policy techniques and even within our own groups for easy accessibility to food because that is how we create a, a framework on easy accessibility to Christ's salvation. Okay? Thank you. So, so this whosoever will, coming from wherever you are, um, our whole culture should... Uh, relish the idea, relish, no pun intended, condiments, uh, <laughs> should, should relish the idea of how do we make it easy for anybody to produce food? How do we make it easy for anybody to get food? How do we make it easy for people to be uh, uh, satiated? Just like in the Christian community, we want to make it easy for people, we don't want to make hurdles, impediments to come to Christ. We don't want to make hurdles. It's repentance and free will, and it's okay from wherever you are, from wherever you've been. It's a whosoever will message. Are you following me here on these object lessons? It's the idea. Okay, next one. Next one. <clears throat> just like eternal life requires a sacrifice that we just commemorated here, Physical life requires a sacrifice. Perhaps one of the biggest uh, uh, problems with chemical fertilizer, in my view, is 
and it fundamentally comes from a mechanistic view of life where in order to have life nothing has to die. We encounter here uh, our fertility is coming from decomposition, a compost pile. Nothing illustrates life and death and regeneration better than a compost pile. You throw in a bunch of chicken guts, a bunch of microbes work on it, and you put it on the soil and you grow grass or apple trees or tomatoes, right? Um, it, and, and so how do we, how do we then um, live most fully as humans? We die to ourselves. We give ourselves to each other. We give ourselves to other people's needs. You know, the greatest life comes from dying to self. You know, one of the biggest, um, you, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, misguided ideas in that, that drives veganism, for example, and this idea that, you know, that, 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 uh, that my dog is my aunt, is my child, is my cat, is a cow, is this that, that we could somehow live without something dying. Well, if you, don't, if you don't think that you can have life without dying, just, you know, try... Um, everything's eating and being eaten. Go lie naked in your flower bed for three days, see what gets eaten. <laughs> <laughs> everything is eating and being eaten. And in order for something to live, something has to die. And how we create sacredness in that death, sacredness in that sac in that giving of life so that when I eat the carrot and the carrot gives up its life for me or the chicken or whatever it is, in order to create sacredness in the sacrifice, it is how I have honored and respected that living being in its life that creates sacredness. There's no sacredness in a Tyson chicken dying. We've abused it, dishonored it, and disrespected it from day one. And so we create sacredness by how we respect and honor the life that it lived. In fact, now new research shows nature is pulsing with sentience. You know, what does it mean when a, when a maple tree, for example, um, um, when, when a wind comes up in the spring and the maple tree withholds its uh, sap flow, so that in case a branch breaks off, it'll be able to send sap to that branch when the wind stops, then it starts going back in your bucket again. If that isn't sentience, I don't know what is. Okay? The fact is, life is not mechanical. Life is far more than mechanical. And there's sentience pulsing all around us. Next little object lesson. Our Christian life is S-O-N driven. This is an easy one. Guess what the objective counterpart is? The physical world that we see is S-U-N driven. Isn't that cool that they're so close? We even say them the same, sun and sun. You know, you, um, All growth and power in our world comes from the sun. Where does all growth and power come in the believer's life? The sun, S-O-N. Photosynthesis through decomposition is the renewal, the ultimate energy for everything that we see around us. Where do we derive our energy as in, in the faith community? It's from the S-O-N. Next one. <clears throat> the unseen spiritual realm is more real than everything we see. The unseen, so, so I would suggest that, that, that soil microbes are an object lesson of the importance and the reality of the unseen spiritual realm. One of the most important things we've got to understand in the faith community is that the invisible is more real than the visible. Ever think about that? The visible is more real than the invisible. And what's dancing around us from angels to demons to everything else 
is more real. Now, I don't want to get us off on some, you know, rabbit trail on, on all this, but, but, but I do want us to appreciate, do I wake up in the morning understanding principalities and powers and things like that that are invisible? How do I cultivate in my life, how do I cultivate a deep appreciation and acknowledgement of that? I cultivate it by waking up in the morning and acknowledging and appreciating my dependency and the importance of the gibberellins, the mycorrhizae, the actinomycetes. You know, when's the last time a banker looking at a business plan said, oh, wow, this is a great business plan, but I got one question. What's it going to do to the actinomycetes in our community? <laughs> You know, we don't think about these things. And yet, does anybody here think that the actinomycetes health is less important than whether the Dow Jones Industrials go up or down? See, that's what I'm talking about. And so how we, how we appreciate in our daily walk that we, we live among invisible stuff is to appreciate the power of this invisible stuff in the, uh, you know, in, in the, in the world we live in. Next one. And we're all familiar with uh, the 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 broad gate, the the and and the narrow way, the narrow way and the broad way. You know, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that that go in. Uh, and I would just suggest that an ob object lesson there is simply the object lesson of of alternative views that generally the broad narrative is never the real story. You know, why would we embrace the orthodoxy? The official explanation is usually wrong. Uh, we're to try the spirits. We're to, you know, we're to seek the minor, the minor point of view. And, and you know, in, in, in our farming career here, we have gone counter to the orthodox opinion all the time. So we take that same idea. We don't grow tomatoes like Monsanto. We don't we don't do things like these other, and, and that, that bolsters and it encourages and it, it actually uh, uh, it is an embrace and an embellishment to help us in all facets of our life to realize we are different. We walk to the beat, we, we, we have a, we, it's a narrow way. Truth is a narrow way. Truth is it's generally not the broad narrative. It's not generally the, the orthodoxy. Truth comes, you have, to, you have to ferret it out. You have to seek it. Ask, seek, and knock, right? Uh, and seek out truth. And so, um, so just as a general rule, um, if we're, you know, if we're, if we're doing according to orthodoxy, we're probably in the wrong place. Um, here's one of my favorites. One of my favorites is, you know, the end of man is to glorify God, right? Catechism, to bring glory to God. You know, we, 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 uh, we spiritualize uh, words. Uh, we, uh, the faith community, we have jargon lots of times. Um, like, 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 baptism, we use it only in churches. But actually, baptism has a great history in non-biblical literature. And it was used primarily in non-biblical literature to describe a ship in a, in a, in a storm in the ocean being baptizoed by the storm. It basically means overwhelmed by, overwhelmed by. Wouldn't it be cool if everywhere the Bible, if it was translated into English, a baptizo, wouldn't it be cool if it, if, if it simply used the phrase overwhelmed by? You know, the same thing is true with, you know, with church. You know, as if church is some sort of a building or some sort of a place. Um, actually, church is the gathering. What if every place the Bible used the word, or, you know, our translation, translators used the word church, well, what if we used gathering instead? Maybe we wouldn't be building so many monuments to... <laughs> and, and so, so we, we, we kind of get this jargonish uh, spiritualization. Glory is one of those words. You know, you don't go down the street in Stanton and, and hear the word glory very often. You know, that's reserved for the sanctuary. But the Bible is not that specific. And so, this is one of my favorites. You all know, um, if anybody had written, read what I've written, you know this is one of my favorites. So, the glory of pigs, first pork rind, 
the glory of pigs is how we create a, a visceral, an object lesson of honoring the glory of God. The glory of something is its distinctiveness. It, it, it's what makes it special. Um, and, and so I'll just run down some, you know, biblically. Biblically, we're, uh, to show you how um, we, have, we, have, we don't use the word glory in its full dimension. Uh, the Bible talks about the glory of children, the glory of young men is their strength, the glory of Moab, the glory of Keter, the glory of Lebanon, the glory of the Gentiles, the glory of Ephraim, uh, the glory of women, uh, in 1 Corinthians, long hair, glory of the celestial, glory of the terrestrial, glory of the sun, glory of the moon in 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter, glory of man. Good grief. You mean glory is, yeah, it's all over the place. So, Imagine you're getting ready to eat Sunday dinner and you're having pork. Be and, 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 and your children are sitting there and so you say, now children, remember the farm that we went and visited last week and those pigs that we saw? <clears throat> and we talked about how those pigs have a, have a very wonderful habitat to express their pigness. And they were able to root in the ground. They were able to run and gamble. And we talked about how that was a full expression of the pig. Yeah, 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 mommy. Yeah, daddy. Yeah, okay. Well, the reason that we buy our pork from that farm is be, and we're eating that pork from that farm today is because we want to honor and respect the glory of the pig in its full essence as an object lesson for you to understand the importance of honoring and respecting the glory of God. Now, now we saw how the pigs exhibited their specialness. Well, what's special about God? And you can have a discussion about sovereignty, about, um, you know, holiness and, um, and omniscience and omnipresence and these tremendous, right, attributes of God that make him distinct among everything. We're not omniscient. We're not omnipresent. What, what is the glory? His distinctiveness is his glory, and we bolster it in our families by patronizing food and farming that affirms and respects and honors the glory of the beings that are being farmed and grown. Does that make sense? To me, it's so simple. It's so simple. And it would radicalize our theology. So how do we create a habitat in our lives that honors the glory of God, <coughs> that honors His specialness? Other one is, uh, is forgiveness. Forgiveness, you know, forgiveness. Sounds like a pretty big kind of academic word, you know, forgiveness. And, and in nature, we tend, to, we tend to equate forgiveness, I like to equate it with resilience, okay? Fact is, things happen. Just like in our lives, we say unfit words to people, we lose our temper, we, we get frustrated, we get angry, we get, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and of course we sin. And we sin against God, we sin against each other, and, and we're, you know, we get, we get buffeted it about by our own, you know, uh, uh, preconditions the same way nature does you know every day is like this sometimes there's a flood sometimes there's a blizzard uh, sometimes there's a drought um, and so so resiliency is like is like preparing for those buffetings just like forgiveness builds shock absorbers into our life so that we can say that unfit word. We can have a bad hair day and we can ask forgiveness and that relationship can be healed. So that's the difference between mechanics and biology. If a bearing goes out in your car, <clears throat> you can rest it. You can apologize for not greasing it. You can, you know, um, um, whatever you want to do, and when you get back in the car and run, uh, the bearing is not going not to work. But 
biologically, living things can forgive. We can heal relationships. We can heal the land. You know, the, 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 one of the greatest joys of my life is, is remembering with this place when I could walk as a child the whole farm and never set foot on a piece of vegetation. It was that barren. I remember when there wasn't enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes and dad poured concrete in car tires, put a half inch pipe down in them and our brother and I, who's older than I, the two, us two boys, we could sit on the back of the uh, tractor platform and we could heave these, uh, these concrete stanchions off so dad could go put electric fence stakes down to put electric fence up because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. Today, those fields are green and have 12 inches of soil on them. That's forgiveness. This land was pillaged and exploited and, 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 and raped while its owners were down at the church putting offerings into play. What was going through their mind when the gullies were starved? And when we lost five feet of topsoil over 150 years. Immunity is part of forgiveness. How forgiving is our bodies for assaults are going to come. You know, that's the thing. And they're going to come. And, uh, and so, so building shock absorbers. So how we, how we build resilience into our immune system, our lives, our lands, that's all part of, 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 of building an object lesson to help us to understand forgiveness in our spiritual life and that, and that nothing we can do keeps Christ's forgiveness from reaching out and picking us up when we fall. Does life resilience come from a, from a syringe or a pill or by design from God's order? Next one is uh, seeking. Say, so I need to seek the Lord. Well, how, how, what does that look like? What does seeking look like? Well, I would say it looks like participation. Physically, it looks like participation. You know, um, nobody gets a free pass. I've never gone by the pond down here and heard a frog say, you know what, I'm just not going to participate today. I'm going to take the day off. Frogs don't do that. Nature doesn't do that. There's never a day that a grass blade says, you know what, all that sunshine, yeah, I'm going to shut down chlorophyll today, photosynthesis, we're not going to participate. In nature, nothing gets, a, nothing gets a free pass to check out. You don't get to sit in the stands. And Jesus commands us to come to him. We've got to come to him. The earth is bathed in, bathed in opportunity, but we must accept and leverage that opportunity, just like the spiritual life. We don't have the option to check out a Christ. If we've accepted him, we're ready to follow him. We don't have the option to check out. I'm just not going to participate this year. Next one. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would say a great physical uh, 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 object lesson of that is, is just the external abuses that we've done. You know, um, when we pull its strings and stake up the neighborhood, is that good for the, good for the neighbors? Sticky neighborhoods, disrespect toward life. War against the creation. You know, when I was a kid, we never heard phrases like food allergy. We didn't know about all these things. We didn't, uh, you know, Campylobacter, Listeria, type 2 diabetes, all these things were not as a part of the lexicon. But as we have abandoned the golden rule toward nature and not treated nature in our neighborhoods like we'd like to be treated, we've abandoned that now we have all these conditions. The question is, as we look through our plate and we look through the menu on our plate, does it match what we affirm in the pew? We say do unto others as we'd like them to do unto you and then we raise factory chickens in stinky houses and pollute everybody's groundwater and send uh, nitrates into the aquifer and that's not very neighbor friendly with me but it sure gives us money to put in the offering plate see the, see the dichotomy so what do we do I'm ready to finish up here so what do we do with all this what, 
how do we, as, as Francis Schaeffer said, how should we then live? What, what, what's, the, what's the deal? And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a laundry list of, of uh, what I would like to see. That's the way, that's what, you know, in my greatest fantasies and dreams and, and vision, what I would like to see our faith community, and I'm using that very broadly, our faith community, what, how, how, could we, how could we embrace some of this? Because I've been in these situations. You know, I've, I, I was up in, at the University of Guelph in, uh, in, in uh, Canada. I want a panel with two other people. And uh, each of us had a five-minute opening monologue. And the guy next to me has a Bible. Well, this will be interesting. And so he stands up. He's, he's first. I'm second. And there's another lady over here that's third. And then we're going to do a two-hour you know, Q&A town hall kind of format at this university. And uh, he gets up. He gets up first. And he holds his Bible aloft for five minutes and says, You students need to understand that every polluted river, every eroded field, every gully, every, and he just went, is because of this book. Well, that was a nice intro. <laughs> so I've been in these situations. Um, you know, I sat down at a banquet table. Uh, I can't remember where it was, another conference I was speaking at. Six of us, you know, these round banquet tables. I sit down, and um, you know, normally you, you, you kind of introduce yourself around the table. You know, hi, I'm Joel, and I'm, you know, Allison, and I'm Mark, and, you know. We all sat down, and the guy looks at me, and he, I mean, just, first thing he says, well, I don't even know what his name is. He just simply says, I hate Christians. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he proceeded to tell me how, uh, hypocritical as you know they go to sanctity of life rallies and they stop at McDonald's on their way home which epitomizes abuse and disrespect of life kind of gets you thinking you know in the faith community we say how can you want to save the baby whales but you don't care at all about saving baby humans and we just can't even rectify that. We can't wrap our heads around that kind of you know, dichotomy, right? For them, a family going home from right to life rally that stops at McDonald's is just as hypocritical. So what do we do? What do we do with this? Probably my greatest uh, of affirmation of some of my ideas here was at the University of Berkeley. So I, I, I was asked to speak at the University of Berkeley, and um, I have this, you know, I have 300 students, grad students, all sitting down in front, and um, and I I did my slide program actually for farm, and I talked about you know creation, I talked about sanctity of life, God. I mean, those aren't my main things. I'm talking about farming, but within the context, you know. And I uh, got done, and they stood up and gave me a standing ovation. Now, if you know about UC Berkeley, oh okay, all right. <laughs> so we got done, and and by now it's dark, you know. And the two professors who had me, you know, so we're, they they know my penchant for ice cream, and so we're going to go out to an ice cream place afterwards. We get out of the we got out of the lecture hall. We hadn't gone, you know, twenty yards under a street lap, and they both kind of gone around and they stopped me in the front. They said, we got a confession to make. Oh, this is interesting. Um, I said, so what, what's the deal? They said, we were scared to death. Thanks for telling me that. You <laughs> me a little bit before I got there. And uh, I said, why? They said, well, you got to realize that during the, during the early 70s with the Vietnam era, you know, where Berkeley led the, you know, led the anti-Vietnam movement, um, the, the, the student body perfected a way to show their disapproval for guest speakers when they came. And it's, it's a hissing, it's a And you know, so, so a guy's up you know, lecturing, speaking, whatever, and if he says something that's not politically correct, that they don't. This is back in the 70s. This is long before wokeism and everything we got today. It was a precursor. But he said, he said, the students have perfected this, this 
this way to express their indignation against a, a guest speaker. You know, it's very, very hospitable. They, they weren't out to be very, very hospitable. <laughs> And, uh, and, and they said, we do some of the things you were going to say, and we just wondered how many of those you were going to get tonight. <laughs> not only did I not get one, and, 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 and I'm sorry, then they said, they said you're the first that between them, they, they were there like for 20 years, they had a long tenure, you know, behind, under them. And they said, we have never, ever heard a speaker use the word God respectfully on this campus without being hissed. Not once, until tonight. And it struck me, it struck me, this is the problem with us. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say I was consistent. I'm, I'm not consistent. All of us have our hypocrisies. Every one of us, okay? Just get over it. We're, we all have our... But, but, I'm convinced that it was the first time these students heard a believer speak from a wrestling standpoint of trying to reconcile and not be a hypocrite in these areas and actually take the spiritual realm that we uh, that we you, you learn in our little catechism classes and say what does that look like in my life it's so easy to go fill in Sunday school papers and little word puzzles with spiritual concepts and spiritual words. But it's really hard to embrace that viscerally, viscerally in our lives. So what do we do? And, 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 and as a result of that, you know, and numerous experiences like it, I, I'm convinced that the faith community, we should have been, we should have been the ones that championed organic farming. We should have been ones that out there saying we're fearfully and wonderfully made. It ain't Monsanto. It ain't Tyson chickens. It's it's way more complex. It's relational. It's biodiverse. It's 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 mystical. It's fantastical. It's invisible. It's fantastic. We should have owned the high ground of stewardship, not the Gaia community, not the creation worshipers. We, the Creator worshipers, should have owned that moral high ground. But instead, since it was co-opted by the creation worshipers, the faith community threw out the whole deal with the baby with the bathwater. See? To where now, if I dare to go to church and say, should we not use styrofoam? What are you, some sort of greeny, weeny, come be pinko? Earth muffin? <laughs> we, 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 can't even, we can't even have the discussion, right? Because we all know environmentalists, a bunch of liberal Democrats don't give a, you know, right? And so, so here we are. Okay? Here we are. It's a real dilemma. It's a real problem. So I'm going to very quickly, I know I'm out of time, but let me give you some, some, some ideas. Just some ideas, all right? So what do we do? Number one, imagine. Imagine if our churches adopted farmers to buy their food from. We're getting together every week anyway. Why don't you adopt five or six farmers? One can be the you know beef guy, one can be the tomato, one can bring the noodles, and one, you know, whatever. But within our churches, imagine if a few mega churches, Joel Osteen and, and whatever, okay? Imagine if a few of them adopted six, seven, ten farmers to feed that congregation. Wow, what a deal that would be. It would drive the environmentalists nuts. What? Church is interested in stewardship? How can that be? That's crazy, you know. Um, all right, number two. How about if our churches focus on creating a parallel universe community? A parallel universe community. Instead of, instead of, patronizing the yellow pages and the, the world system, how about we, we develop a directory of, ex, of expertise and we start building a community of people who know how to build things, fix things, and grow things within our own churches. 
So we know who the mechanic is, who the electrician is, who the plumber is, who the roof fixer is, who the food grower is, who's the herbalist that can fix me without going to the hospital, who's the, who's the, the, the one that's gifted to massage and can fix my you know, sore muscle without um, you know, a prescription. Are you with me? But instead, we come to prayer meeting and we're all praying about trying to find the best orthodox thing for whatever ails us instead of building our parallel universe. So, so you know, a directive of expertise with, within the body, um, uh, work projects within the body, you know, uh, in, instead, of, instead of me hiring somebody who uh, couldn't care a lick about these things, how about we, we present our work projects to the group? I mean, this is what the Amish do. I always said I like to be Amish. I just don't want the, I just don't want the narrow suspenders. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I have a deep appreciation for the Amish. I just don't want to have to wear the costume. That's it. Uh, but but I have a deep appreciation. I'm, I'm not saying this. I mean, it's funny, but it's but it's but it's very true. I mean, I, I would love to not have to pay insurance into anybody because I know if a house burns down, a bunch of pe 50 people are going to swarm over the house, raise it, get it, I'll have a brand new house in two weeks, don't have to pay for it. That's cool, okay? <laughs> Instead of paying $10,000 a year for house insurance, property insurance, all these things, into a system that is, that is devoted and dedicated to disrespecting and dishonoring creation. How about another one? Uh, how about we churn our churchyards into gardens? So instead of having sort of landscape crews, instead of running a, you know, a bunch of zero-turn mowers over the lawnscape every week, we actually open it up for community gardens and start growing food and have an edible landscape instead of just, I, don't, I like flowers too. You can eat some flowers too. But, but, but let's, let, you know, I mean, we have, we have expansive yardscapes. Um, whole you know what, what if what if the landscape committee turned into a growing food committee wouldn't that be something next one church kitchens churches have lots of kitchens big kitchens we can turn those kitchens into teaching centers for culinary arts they could be um you know we, we could teach people how to cook how to can how to how to do these things they can be community food processing hubs uh, the church could buy extra big, uh, extra big canners and extra big food dehydration centers, freeze dryers, that sort of thing. So the community of the gardens of people could come there, and and you don't have to be a Christian. This is just community outreach, okay? Becoming a center of visceral participation in creation stewardship. You know, so so that our church kitchens are not just places to accumulate. Costco stuff on sale to put in the in the uh, the homeless food barrel. How about we all we all say we're going to collect food, but it's got to be collect. It's going to be food that you grew in your garden, so it's really nutritious stuff, and not the crash scratch and dead stuff from Costco. All right, another one. How about if church functions were turned into visceral intentionality? There's a big word. Church folks into visual intentionality. So, for example, we have a potluck, and everybody has to break stuff from scratch and put the recipe on the dish. How about the youth group, instead of going to King's Dominion or, or some resort place, how about the youth group gets armed with, uh, with, with hoes and mattocks and goes and chops thistles on some neighbor's farm or cleans out you know, to, to, to learn how to battle sin. You know, brambles came from sin, right? Brambles came up. So we're going to learn how to battle sin. We're going to come up to this multiflora rose and we're going to, let's see now, where is this weak spot? We're going to attack the weak spot and, and we're going to, you know, root out sin. Now when the youth group meets, guess what? They got an object lesson of how do you deal with sin? What's your weak link? Remember that multiflora rose you dug last week and you circle around, circle around, circle around, look at that thing. Where can I get in there and get a whack at that thing? So what's that in your life and your sin where's the weak link where can you get a whack at this problem are you with me wouldn't that be cool how about how about we don't use any styrofoam in our services instead we wash dishes and don't fill up any trash cans how about how about healthy snacks in the nursery and for VBS instead of GMO cookies 
and M&Ms. How about, and finally, how about parishioners? Parishioner, we, we, we cultivate parishioner awareness and activity. You know, um, in this space, we, we have this idea that, that you, you've got to have your attitude right and everything else will fall in place. Jesus said, in remember what he said? He said, store up treasure in heaven for where your treasure is. Yes, thank you. You finished it for me. There will your heart be also. We've got it backwards all the time. We say, you got to get your heart right. Get your heart right. Get your heart right. Come on. You start doing the right things and your heart will follow. You start doing the right things. Activity creates attitude. We know this from all the, the, the self-improvement books. Think about how many of them you want to you wanna have a new habit in your life. You know, the 66 step plan. You do it supposedly 66 days and then it's a like habit. Um, I've done that. It, 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 actually, it actually works. I might not like it. I might not enjoy it. But I know I need to do it, so I'm doing it. You do it for 66 days, it becomes a habit. Okay? Um, well, that's the same way a lot of this is. Imagine if we started just doing some things, like like everybody in the in the church um, is going to get a. We're all going to go together, and we're and we're going to we, we can buy them in bulk, probably get a discount. Everybody's going to get a solarium on the side of their house. A solarium. We got one on the side of our house. And don't tell me you got to have a, a new house. Our house is built in 1790, and it has a top grade cedar built kit solarium on it. Okay, so you can grow cool, hardy stuff in the winter, and you don't have to go to Costco. And you don't have to come to Premier. I can't afford this food. Grow your food for crying out loud, and the and the, and, the, and the church will come around and help you. And somebody who has a green thumb in the church will do a class in the church kitchen and then a demo in a, in a cold frame out back and show you how to do this. Okay, so we're not having to go down to Walmart and buy our sustenance. And we're creating a parallel universe. How about we, we get the plumbers together to show everybody and, and start putting everybody a, a, a gray water system in their houses so we can reduce our water by 50%. Half of all the water in America goes down the toilet. All we got to do is read plumb and, 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 and save a lot of water. Cisterns, you know, we're, we'll, we'll put in cisterns. Collect your roof water, now you don't have a utility bill. Unplug, unplug the system. Um, backyard chickens, you know, everybody should have their own eggs, gardens, you know, wood stoves. We'll show you how to run a chainsaw. Maybe somebody sells wood, um, you know, uh, build hoop houses. These, these are goals. What these are, these are not um, to try to, you know, create some sort of elite thing. Our whole goal here is that when the world is hopeless and helpless, we as a body provide hope and help for the pain points of the world. If I ask for a laundry list this morning, all the stuff that you're frustrated about, angry about, we can all make a pretty big list. Okay? But our objective should be to take that list and instead of being angry and frustrated about it, let's be innovative and creative building hope and help when societies become hopeless. We then become a city set on a hill, a community of attractiveness physically that draws people to attractiveness spiritually. And that's what this weekend's been about. This weekend's been about trying to awaken the faith community, awaken so that we take these ideas, these principles to our churches and if we could create a, a, a movement of stewardship and authentic responsibility and, and wrestling with consistency viscerally in our congregations, our churches, our faith community, we would suddenly garner equity. We would garner societal equity where people would say, wow, I want to go hear them. And we wouldn't squander what we have. We would actually elevate it. We would leverage it. 
and bring, bring people to the kingdom. That's what we're after. Building the kingdom, bringing the kingdom, and we can't do it when we're mired down, trying to live like, act like, recreate like, entertain like, and be like the world. It is time for us as a faith community to set ourselves apart, serve him where? Without the camp. To create a line of differentiation that is so attractive, the world can't stand it, and they want to come and hear our message. <laughs> let's, let's close in prayer. Our Lord, we are so grateful that you are for us. You are not against us. You are for us. We feel beaten down. We feel marginalized. It's so easy to get our eyes onto the waves and off of Christ like Peter did in the tossed sea. Let us keep our eyes focused on you, on the prize. Moving not just theologically, but practically. Moving practically toward a place of service and a place of healing in all its dimensions in our culture. Forgive us where we have failed in this. And empower us to be intentional, honest, and authentic about trying to bring this to our congregations our communities, and our culture. May our light shine in all of its resplendent glory in our world. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.